Boa, Boise, the city of trees. Our story actually begins 200 years ago, when trappers reportedly named the river that flows through our valley Boise, perhaps after the trees growing there. While the origins of our name are somewhat disputed, the fact that the Boise River Valley was an important meeting place for people of many backgrounds, nations, and tribes is not. For decades, Indians met English and French trappers along the braided and wooded river. The flat benches in this valley featured large encampments whose campfires lit up the night sky. Castle Rock was a sacred monument for some Shoshone members and Table Rock was used for smoke signals that could be seen for miles. While Captain Bonneville may have yelled Les Bois as he descended into the valley in 1833, he certainly wasn't the first to visit, nor the first to notice, the features of this area. By 1860, the site featured a bustling crossroads of sorts. The Oregon Trail, on its way west to the Promised Land, intersected with a new trail heading north into the newly discovered gold fields of Boise Basin. A town had started, and services for travelers were available. Boise was an isolated but important stop for many who were traveling to find their fortune somewhere else. When the Civil War started in 1861, the Northwest quickly became important. The Union was desperate for gold to finance the war, and the 1862 Homestead Act would quickly attract free soil settlers out west. The nation needed to organize this promising new territory. In 1863, in the midst of the most important year of the nation's civil war, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Idaho Territory into existence on March 4th. Immediately after, the federal government established a fort in its present-day location up against the foothills of the Treasure Valley and to the north of a growing and boisterous downtown. The fort was initially created to protect gold miners who were now pouring into the valley on their way to uncertain fortunes. At first, protection was needed from local Indian tribes, who had responded aggressively to settlement, so much so that early homes along Warm Springs featured gun holes in the exterior walls. Soon, with an early business census reporting five saloons and hundreds of local farmers, miners, and settlers crowding the few blocks of the town, it was the Indians who sought respite from attack. On the same day as the brave soldiers at Gettysburg withdrew from that battle on July 4, 1863, Major Pinckney Luganbeel picked the site for Fort Boise at the crossroads. Luganbeel quickly had his commanding officer's house built, elegantly designed in the federal style, and perched atop the hill overlooking the fort training grounds. The house was built using sandstone from the nearby Boise Hills and was quickly joined by other elegant homes that completed Officer's Row. The grounds of the fort were developed over time, with various buildings serving the soldiers and providing the training grounds for military preparedness. Over the next few decades, soldiers from Fort Boise, later renamed Boise Barracks, prepared for numerous campaigns, including the Mexican Border Campaign in 1916 involving Pancho Villa and World War II. After World War I, the fort began its history as a veterans hospital and facility, which remains its purpose today. Three days after the fort site was selected, several local men of importance, including Tom Davis, met at Davis's cabin by the river near his apple orchard. These men created the original plat of Boise on July 7, 1863, and lot owners included Major Luganbeel, Davis, and several ferrymen, along with various merchants. The town of Boise was laid out between the fort and the Boise River, and wooden residences, storefronts, and even the Statesman newspaper office were constructed along dirt streets, according to the plat. Homes began to pop up. Boise recorded 725 residents in 1863, 135 of whom were women. Families quickly built cabins to be later replaced with homesteads. John O'Farrell, an Irish sailor and miner who was forced to the U.S. because of the Irish potato famine, brought his wife, Mary Ann, out west to Boise, drawn by cheap, good land. They built their cabin near the fort, and today it stands as the oldest remaining residence in Boise. O'Farrell's cabin was only meant as a temporary residence, built like many early residences as a rough-hewn log shack. Its tight cottonwood construction has stood the test of time, with some help in the early 20th century from the daughters of the American Revolution and, more recently, 
from the city of Boise. Often passed by, it certainly represents our beginnings. Later, O'Farrell would join other men of prominence, such as Cyrus Jacobs, in building larger, nicer homes out of brick, along with various houses of worship. The O'Farrell and Jacobs families represented just the beginning of the flow of immigrants who would make their way west. Boise quickly grew from its original plat of 20 blocks and 700 residents, spreading northwards of the river towards the fort. Besides early miners and farmers, many other groups of people sought out Boise over the first three decades of its existence, including businessmen, church builders, fortune seekers, a large contingent of Missouri Confederates, and radical Republicans. There was even a proposed colony of freed Southern slaves, the brainchild of the part-time territorial governor Caleb Lyon. With an increase in population, there was a natural increase in crime in Boise. To deal with the less lawful, the old penitentiary was built in 1870 at the base of Table Rock. Future inmates were sent up the mountain to quarry the sandstones that were later used to build their prison, along with many other prominent buildings in Boise. Evidence of this activity can still be seen on the east side of Table Rock in the Tram Trail. The Penn's Romanesque sandstone towers were designed with the Auburn system in mind, imposing to the inhabitants and reinforcing the ideas of penance and confinement. When built, the old pen was on the outskirts of town, close to the nearby Native American settlements. During the era of the Indian Wars in the 1870s, the stone walls of the old pen kept the inmates safe from Indian raids as much as they kept the settlers safe from the criminals. During its 103-year run, the old pen housed over 13,000 inmates. As time passed, Boise expanded and the old pen was no longer out of town. Post-war, until 1973, when the penitentiary shut down after a prison riot and a fire, Boise East Enders, who neighbored the old pen, had to adhere to the sirens that blared when an inmate escaped. At a moment's notice, locals had to make sure to keep their doors shut in case the fugitive inmate showed up on their doorstep. Today, the old pen is a museum and event center, featuring concerts, food festivals, and a multitude of fun tours, sometimes involving ghosts and historical figures. Property crime was the reason for the territorial pen, and gold mining was the boom industry in this valley in the 1870s. To manage all the gold, weigh it, and assess its value, the U.S. Assay Office was built by the federal government in 1871 and was one of only seven offices of its kind in the country. Featuring an elegant Italianate style that appeared in other structures of the time, and secure two-foot-thick walls of sandstone, the building saw an average of over a million dollars in gold per year flow through its doors. With a decrease in gold mining in the 20th century, the assay office was eventually closed in 1933 and now houses the Idaho State Historic Preservation Office, and at least one ghost. Not just a wild frontier town anymore. By the 1880s, Boise was maturing, and many of its inhabitants were reflecting their sophistication in the styles of their residences. Nice homes were added along Grove Street, such as C.W. Moore's house with a mansard roof and Italianate brackets. Others were building Queen Anne homes north of town, towards the fort. Boise received telephone service in 1884, earned a spur line railroad in 1887, and saw a number of elegant churches built to serve locals. Mrs. O'Farrell had helped organize the first Catholic worship services in the valley in their cabin, before the O'Farrells helped start St. Patrick's Church, replaced later on by the original St. John's Cathedral in 1883. Methodists and Baptists also built early churches, and Episcopalians established themselves in the valley with the building of elegant St. Michael's Church in 1866. Currently located on the edge of the BSU campus, it is the oldest Protestant church in Boise today. With these amenities, the number of women and children increased in Boise, and locals decided to expand the small education system in town. Territorial legislator R.Z. Johnson led the push for the creation of the Boise Independent School District 
by way of a bill passed in 1881, and Central School, the area's first secondary school, opened a year later near where the state capitol is located today. Johnson, a prominent lawyer in town, went on to become one of the most important men in Boise and opened a new law office downtown in 1885. Constructed simply in brick, with Greek revival elements that parallel the order Johnson sought to establish with his law practice, the building remains today as a more sophisticated part of territorial Boise. His apartment building right around the corner from his office, and fit for a successful lawyer, was designed as a mix of Tudor, Queen Anne, and even Flemish Romantic styles, and was constructed in 1892. Johnson's practice thrived, even as his service with the territorial legislature continued. He and the other legislators were soon treated to a new territorial capital building in 1886. Designed in what has been described as eclectic Romanesque, this building lasted a short 34 years until it was torn down to make room for the east wing of the new state capital in 1919. By 1889, Boise had experienced tremendous change. No longer just a territorial fort accompanied by a makeshift collection of brush shacks and adobe buildings, Boise was a capital where folks moved to make a city out of the desert. Populated with well-constructed government buildings, stylishly designed homes for merchants, elegant houses of worship, and an increasing number of well-crafted commercial buildings, Boise was built for the future. And indeed, the future as a state capital was right around the corner.